Pathogens have been evolving with their hosts for a very long time, and in the process they have come up with just about every trick in the book to evade or suppress the host defenses. In this lecture we're going to look at how they can evade by varying their surface properties. This is done by viruses, bacteria, and by eukaryotes like plasmodium and, and trypanosomes. They can hide inside the genome, that's what retroviruses do. They can hide inside cells, which is what uh, plasmodium, the malaria pathogen, the trypanosoma, toxoplasma, mycobacterium, listeria, all of these are pathogens that actually hide inside the host cell. And they can also suppress the host immune system by disrupting its function by producing proteins, by blocking intracellular defenses, by slowing down the recruitment of immune cells, by, and by killing immune cells. So viruses can suppress the immune system. They do it by inhibiting humoral immunity, and that's done with, by disrupting sensors. So some of the viruses that do this are herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus, and vaccinia. They can inhibit inflammatory responses by disrupting cytokines and cell adhesion, so they play with the host's signaling system. This is done by vaccinia, myxoma, the Epstein-Barr virus, which causes infectious mononucleosis and several cancers. They can block antigen processing by inhibiting gene expression and peptide transport. That's done by herpes simplex and cytomegalovirus. And they can immunosuppress the host with mimics of interleukins. Epstein-Barr virus does this. They can also disrupt the cytoplasmic sensors of viral RNA. And that's done by paromyxoviruses, which include the agents that cause mumps and measles. So viruses have a pretty diverse repertoire of methods of suppressing the host immune system. Many bacteria can vary their surface properties by mispairing simple sequence repeats. So these are sequences that are involved in genes that are expressing uh, cells that are found on the surfaces of bacteria. And if they simply can vary by adding or deleting the number of nucleotides in the sequence, they will be producing DNA of different lengths that will then be causing different uh, triplet codes to be produced for the proteins. Here are some of the phenotypic consequences. You can think of these as being molecules up on the surface. So, for example, this box here is for sialic acid that can be added or dropped. Gal is a galactose that can be added or dropped. PC is a phosphorylcholine that can be added or dropped. And LIK1A, those are genes that mediate the attachment of these ligands. And what you see is that the bacteria, a single bacteria with a single genome, can produce quite an array of different surfaces. And these are the surface molecules that the antibodies from the host immune system are binding to. So basically what it's doing is it's switching its coat. Some bacteria hide inside host cells. For example, Listeria monocytogenes, which causes listeriosis, moves from macrophage to macrophage without emerging into the extracellular environment. So it's actually hiding inside one of the cells of the immune system. Toxoplasma gondii, which causes toxoplasmosis, makes a cyst, a cyst inside which it's invisible to the immune system. Mycobacterium, which causes leprosy, spreads by converting nerve cells to stem cells that then can invade muscle. So these are all ways that bacteria use to stay away from the humoral immunity, the antibodies and the uh, complement that are circulating in the blood. They hide inside cells. Plasmodium has quite an array of methods of evading its uh, vertebrate host. Several stages hide inside cells, particularly inside red blood cells or inside liver cells. The merozoites that are out in the blood and therefore subject to attack 
vary their surface molecules based on allelic polymorphisms and variable expression from multi-gene families. So they are under attack from opsonizing antibodies. They're under attack from complement deposition. They're under attack from invasion blocking antibodies. And they, their co-evolved response to evade and suppress is to vary their sequence while maintaining their function and to have reduced an antigenicity and to have redundancy in their multi-gene families which allows them to generate this, these variable surface molecules. Here is plasmodium hiding in an infected red blood cell. These red blood cells do not carry MHC class I proteins. They also lack nuclei. There is no immune surveillance by cytotoxic T cells. However, infected red blood cells are cleared in the spleen where they can be recognized because infection increases their rigidity. So the membrane properties of the red blood cell are altered. Plasmodium prevents being cleared by inserting a protein called PFEMP1, PFEMP1, into the surface of the red blood cells. And that helps binding to capillaries and it delays passage through the spleen, but it also mediates cerebral malaria. So this reaction to getting cleared by the spleen causes a change in the properties of the red blood cell that may also make it more likely to stick to capillaries in the brain. The host immune system targets PFEMP1. So you can see there's a whole series of moves and counter moves going on here. The pathogen then evades by varying PFEMP1. It's coded by VAR genes. There are about 60 of them in the malaria genome, in the plasmodium genome. One VAR gene is expressed at a time, and there's antigenic switching at a rate of about 2% per infected red blood cell. So the immune response is out of phase with the parasite. It lacks behind. So this is the log of parasite density here. Immunity ramps up, starts to hit the first one, the color indicates a switch to the second kind of protein. It starts to ramp up. Uh, the immune system starts to hit it. During the time that the second is ramping up, the first one can persist and so forth. In this way, the malaria parasite manages to maintain a pretty reasonable density in the blood. So it's showing here about log four density in the blood. Another case of varying surface proteins is done by the trypanosomes. The trypanosomes are eukaryotes with a single flagellum. Their morphology is categorized according to where you find the, the flagellum attached. So they're called things like amastigotes, which lack flagellae, promastigotes, epimastigotes, tripomastigotes, and so forth. They are exclusively parasitic and they cause three major human diseases, sleeping sickness, Chagas disease, and leishmaniasis, all pretty nasty diseases. They also vary their surface protein. So here is a, an enhanced photo of a trypanosome with some red blood cells behind it. They live extracellularly in the blood where they're subject to attack by the immune system. There they are targeted by antibody response. Their surface is covered with a dense coat of a single protein. And they have variable surface glycoproteins, so they can vary their surface properties. This VSG, variable surface glycoprotein, undergoes frequent genetic modification. This antigenic variation is what lets the infection survive in the blood. And it's done with cycling. So the trypanosomes rapidly cycle a protective variant surface protein, which is their coat. A single trypanosome has more than 1,500 VSG genes. Most of them are located in silent arrays, and most are pseudogenes. So this genetic information has to be activated and moved into the right place to be expressed. We do not yet understand how the pseudogenes recombine 
to produce the genes that encode the functional coats. Only one variable surface gene is expressed at a time from one of about 15 telomeric VSG expression site transcription units. So these are moved around in the genome of trypanosoma, but exactly what mechanism gets it in, into position for expression is not yet known. Pathogens can also suppress the immune system. Mycobacterium tuberculosis blocks the fusion of a phagosome with a lysosome. Plasmodium sporozoites slow down T cell recruitment. Leishmania lives in neutrophils and in dendritic cells and it blocks their maturation. It also expresses a protein that disrupts host immune signaling. So interestingly, a number of pathogens actually live inside the weapons that the host deploys to fight them. They live inside the cells of the immune system. Pathogens from viruses to worms produce enzymes that disrupt immune, system, immune function. For example, this is done by toxoplasma, which phosphorylates a host resistance protein. And hookworms suppress intestinal proteases and stimulate production of the immune cells that can reduce inflammation. Some pathogens also disrupt the immune system with cysteine kinases that are immunomodulatory. So a, these are particularly effective disruptors of immune function. This method has been converged upon by parasites and pathogens, worms, amoebae, leishmania, plasmodium, trypanosoma, bacteria, and viruses all do this. The action is to cleave the immunoglobulin Gs, which are antibodies in blood and lymph, to modulate interleukin concentrations and to control immune cell populations. So this particular kinase is a particular way of, a, a, a very effective way of messing up at least three aspects of immune function. To summarize, most pathogens have evolved mechanisms to evade or suppress the immune system. Some of them vary their surface properties. Some of them hide inside cells or in the genome. Some of them manipulate cytokine and interleukin signals. And some of them cleave antibodies. Some of them actually kill immune cells. It's a diverse repertoire of countermeasures in this game of move and countermove.